Buongiorno, good morning. It is a great pleasure and delight and honor to moderate this first session uh, entitled The Common Good, Seeking Shared Values. And it's a pleasure to welcome our distinguished speakers at this session, Monsignor Bruno Marie Dufay, Bishop Paul Tai, Miss Mitchell Baker, and Mr. Uh, Reed Hoffman. Just a couple of things about uh, this session. Um, our distinguished speakers will have five minutes to um, give a short presentation. Then we will have about 45 minutes um, conversation um, in the panel, um, conversation between the four speakers. And then we will have maybe five minutes each again, if there is time um, to sum up and perhaps to, to offer some concluding reflection. Uh, we, we are going to stick to the time and finish definitely at 10.30 for your coffee break. And I would like to offer a um, couple of rules for, for this session. So let, please let us stick to the five minutes presentation if, if possible. Um, we also need to uh, be aware that this, this is a, a huge theme and huge topic, and we are all, probably all of us, are beyond our comfort zone, comfort zones. So a lot of listening and attentiveness um, is required from all of us in order to have this dialogue. And we really want to make this session truly dialogical so we could have the rest of the um, a conference carried in that spirit of dialogue and learning from each other. Um, so I will invite first Bishop Paul Tai to, to speak for five minutes. If possible. Um, no, good morning and welcome everybody. I suppose my background is from the area of theology and ethics. And from that perspective, Ethical issues have been bubbling up over the last 10, 15 years. I mean, one has been the impact of digitalization. Many of us would have hoped that digitalization, easing communication and shortening the distances between people would have created an easier environment for discussion and for dialogue. And we know that has become quite fractured and polarization, and there are issues that have emerged there. I think AI itself raises ethical questions, the kind of more tractable ones, although we will be looking at these about war, about the future of work, but also ones about what it means to be a human, what things we take for... And then I think one that I learned is very often we're inclined to think digital technologies are instruments. We can use them, we can use them for good, we can use them for bad, but digital instruments actually change the way we think and the way the world is... Um, wired and how we interact with each other and change our, some of our basic concepts. So our engagement isn't simply outside using, it's we ourselves are being transformed at times by the methods and the instruments we use. So there's the complexity of that. What's been interesting in the last three to four years has been, I think, people from the industry, from the other side of the, the technicians and people, are also beginning to talk a lot about ethics. And I think this is maybe partly because of a lack of trust in some environments and people are aware we have to regain trust, and also maybe an awareness that while a lot was done with good intentions, bad actors have managed to do different things with instruments that were developed with the best of intentions. So we've seen what I would like to call almost a turn to ethics. And lots of people working in the area of AI in particular are determined that this should be developed ethically. So we have things like it's going to be ethical by design. It's going to be at the service of humanity. It's going to be AI for good. It's going to be human or person-centered AI, just to use some of the terms. Interestingly, last year, um, Mr. Kissinger did an article in The Atlantic in which he said, look, this turn to ethics is welcome, but maybe technicians are sometimes inclined to think that ethics is simpler than it is. And saying that we're going to move to ideas of putting everything at the service of humanity, we have to realize there's a whole discourse there about 
what we mean by putting something at service of humanity or whose understanding of humanity. And I think this is what we want to tease out a little bit together. And I think ethics, as he said, was never easy. There's a long tradition that developed about ethics. But I think in today's world, it becomes even more complex. A lot of our Western ethical traditions developed in relatively homogenous societies where there's certain a lot of shared values and presumptions whereas we now have to try and use develop an ethic or a way of thinking or criteria of judgment about right and wrong that can be brought into a globalized world that can work across cultures and across religions and in different contexts i think a second issue related to that is we need a kind of an ethics that a language that can be used by technicians and by people coming from the more human and humanity side. So we have to learn there's an interdisciplinarity, which is a great opportunity and a challenge. Then there's one I think sometimes people blame a lot of the difficulties on digitalization. One theologian who I've always admired has made a point that it's not digitalization is necessarily the problem. It's that digitalization took some of the philosophical concepts of postmodernism, where there was a breakdown of any one consensus or any one story we could tell ourselves about the meaning and functioning of life and brought that out to a wider public. So the loss of any consensus on what it is that gives life value, the bigger narratives, even to know our history and our traditions, all disputed, and that coming into a wider circulation. So just to move towards a conclusion, one or two things, I think probably all of us, without necessarily attending to it, have ethical theories that we're using, but we've never necessarily reflected on it. I think one of the interactions between the world of ethics and the world of technology is by helping us to begin to identify maybe the unacknowledged ethical theory that in fact, so some of us might be inclined to do it all by intuition. Others of us might be inclined to feel that, well, rules and regulation tell us what's right and wrong. I think for many in the technical and scientific, there's a default position of some form of utilitarianism because it looks relatively scientific. I look at the consequences, the good consequences, the bad consequences. I measure them. That's a nice kind of word. I compare them and I make choices. I think ethical discourse would want to say problems are not everything is predictable. We don't know what the consequences will be. The other one, not all consequences can be measured on the same scale because we're putting different values into debate. One thing I would like to over these days, hopefully we'll get a chance, is to share a tradition that we have tended to work with within the Catholic tradition, that of the natural and moral law. There are lots of questions about it, but it's a method which says that maybe the best way we can determine what is right and wrong, what are the things that we reflect together, bringing as many voices to the table as possible to explore what it is, what are the values that help humanity to flourish? help individuals to grow, help communities to become stronger and more supportive of each other. So how do we reason together, reflect on what it means to be human, use that as a criteria? And I think despite all the challenges of a globalized and fractured world, can we begin to identify core values, core goods that we want to respect? I suspect we may be better at saying, what are the things we all agree are wrong? What are the things we all agree are to be excluded because they cannot promote human dignity. I think a fruitful dialogue here will be with the world of human rights, which is a language that has a global purchase, although now questioned by some theologians, by some um, sociologists who would say in its own way it becomes a form of cultural imperialism where we're imposing certain values. But I think if we can recover a sense of human rights, not as positive pronouncements of Western judicial systems, but as an attempt to articulate basic human goods that are innate to people, that are rooted in their dignity, and that should be protected at all times, I think that will help us to get some purchase on this debate. I'll just leave it there for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Exactly five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> I now invite Monsignor Bruno Marie Dauphin. So time is a challenge <laughs> in our culture, digital culture. So uh, I would like to uh, propose some very quick uh, reflection introducing to the ethical approach 
um, saying that the, the expression digital age, uh, which endeavors the, to express the digital revolution and its consequences in our way of thinking, bears an interesting resemblance with the concept of artificial intelligence. Uh, we, we were yesterday in this uh, uh, problematics, both as a programmatic and by nature a provisional quality. And uh, I would like that this culture we, we, speak, we speak about with its incessant growth of knowledge and techniques and technologies question the very relationship of subject and instrument as well as the notion of knowledge itself. To be more direct, we could say that uh, this, uh, our, our debate uh, is the debate about the relationship between science and consciousness, between the I know and the we are, and without the doubt with the becoming also, uh, to the ex extent in which we become what we share. The matter of the common good is directly re related, related to the question of sharing our knowledge. And I would say that more than ever today, the fundamental question regarding the evolution of human and instrumental capacities is the question of the definition of what we call intelligence. What is this intelligence today? And what is this intelligence under, understood as a characteristic of our human community? Until today, uh, there were three ways to respond to this delicate and complex question. Intelligence is discovery, that is the capacity to name, to distinguish, and to understand. In other words, to take separately and to put together, to organize, giving a concrete place to every element and every event. Two, intelligence is the capacity to interpret reality, both material and imaginary, Maker, marking in understanding and prioritizing the praise and role of things and being of contractions and knowledge. Third, intelligent is knowledge. We could say in French, notre connaissance. That is the future of those we, we discover and transform, who dream and who hope. Here, to know is to born with and to, and to be together. In other words, to be reborn with those things we, we discover, to open to what is unexpected in life and in this history. Indeed, the question for us today about this knowledge perhaps is, who is speaking to whom? It's really the current issue that we can note in communication of our social networks. In such a confrontation between the discoverer and the data, between the discoverers themselves, three questions arise that structure the approach of ethics. What does it mean to be a subject or an actor today? What does it mean to be responsible and to undertake the challenges of knowledge uh, placed under the double mark of immediacy and obsolescence? Three, what about the reference to the common good in this context of the digital words and patience, which seems to lack the necessary patience required in the process of building a common world? What does it mean to be a subject, and who is the actor of this history today? From here comes the ethical question par excellence. What does it mean to be responsible for and to undertake the challenges and consequences of this knowledge and language in a context marked both by immediacy and obsolescence? It's really a, a, a question to, 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 to give a new definition, a new approach of our common and individual uh, uh, responsibility. And the, the third question is, I think, I think. therefore, uh, one can speak of a paradoxical ethical context where digital impatience intersects with the necessary patience 
required in the process of building a common good. And I would like just put a, a light on this. The common good is understood in our tradition as the sharing of goods received and transmitted. It also be understood as the good of the community, which enjoys itself through sharing. This common good, which we are still trying to understand, can be, re can be reduced to the simple exchange of information. But what about our memory and what about our future? Thus, paradoxically, the, the reference to the common good calls for patience, I, I think. The patience of wisdom, which evaluates, the patience of faith, which is always opening to the other, the other and the others, against the backdrop of digital impatience. Perhaps here we can see the intuition of Pope Francis when he evokes in Evangelii Gaudium, time is greater than space. The space of the digital canvas can, does, does not dispense us from thinking and from living the encounter. Uh, and the common good, the planet, the environment, our common home, our shared activity can only find its profound sense in the encounter. Without a doubt, the culture of encounter allows from the reconciliation of digital impatience and the patient necessary in the process of building the common good through patient listening, comprehension, and intimately love for one another. It's therefore a very great ethical challenge to write and to write continually the development of our knowledge in the construction of a human community opened to the transcendence and to the, to the alterity, the otherness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Monsignor Bruno. I now invite uh, Ms. Mitchell Baker, please. The common good as a topic is a fascinating topic in the interdisciplinary and the, the set of us that you've gathered here because what I'll call Silicon Valley and, and speak primarily of the internet era of it, not so much the personal computer era, but uh, in, in the internet era, the technology industry and, you know, and, and on the web internet side, I, I've you know, been there from the beginning of it. So has had the luxury that uh, to think that whatever product was built was the common good. That, that was the shared, unstated, I think even unknown assumption for quite some time. And then it, it became known, uh, particularly during the Arab Spring, when the sense was that uh, what we call maybe liberty or human expression was embodied in the technology coming out of Silicon Valley and was undisputably good. And so that's been the birth and maybe the adolescence of the, of the Internet industry. Uh, and as Paul has noted, that's really changed recently. Uh, so now we face the issue that it's clear that whatever gets built in technology is not the common good, uh, and we have powerful technologies and powerful actors, and, and yet seeking the common good through a commercial product is a, is a difficult enterprise, and in particular when it's highly centralized and highly globalized. So one of the traits of the digital age is, of course, its global scope, its scale, its speed. And so all of these things make the pursuit of the common good through product even more challenging. I mean, you might argue that in a market that's broad and has competition, people can make choices and there's different prices. You know, there, there is a, you know, a school of thought that, that argues that you do get to common good through market economics. And even if, if one believes that, uh, you certainly have challenges in the, in the current digital age 
and, and our centralization. So there's, there is a, a, a realization and an understanding, but it's not really clear where to go. And, and certainly the language of ethics has come into play, uh, at, but it's, as I experience it, currently unclear whether we mean ethics as a tradition and a discipline or whether ethics has come to mean we want something better. Uh, and, and if it means something better, that's a step forward, but it's not a, it's not a path or, uh, of how to proceed or, or, or what we might do. Um, I, uh, I am hopeful, though. I mean, I lead an organization, Mozilla. Now, we are in Silicon Valley. Uh, we, are a non, we are an NGO, nonprofit organization building technology for the public good. Or, or in our case, we describe our work as trying to build a global public resource. So not exactly the common good, uh, not the language of ethics as a discipline. But we, we work on a set of principles that are laid out. And uh, they, are, they, they include things of safety, some degree of individual autonomy, something about community, something about trust and accountability. And um, I, I've tried very precisely not to become a human, to, to li use the language of human rights or the language of a particular ethical tradition in an effort to be global. And so one of the things that I do find encouraging is that that language is motivating to people across a broad spectrum, like globally. And so I have had the very odd experience of traveling through cultures, many of which don't really have that much place for women in leadership, uh, but nevertheless finding um, people attracted to Mozilla and, and thrilled, not because we're so great, but, but because we have a set of principles which uh, I think are in the direction of an ethical or, or, or a common good or a, a public good. And so it's not that our principles are perfect, but, but there aren't that many organizations actually building technology and allowing and inviting um, citizens globally to participate and understand and build this world for us together that, that operate on principles. And, and so I'm sure that we're early you know, and deeply flawed, but uh, what I take from it is a global appetite from a, a broad range of cultures and all religious traditions, um, trying to work together to build something, which I think I would never go so far to say as we've understood the common good, but it is in a direction of that. And so uh, there is an, an immense appetite among a set of technologists uh, and I think a global citizenry to find a language that incorporates you know, ethical and moral traditions into some global good that represents the, the digital age and has a positive meaning for all of us. Uh, and we have found in recent years things such as inclusion, you know, it needs to be added very explicitly, things like the nature of knowledge. What, what is a, is there a fact? What is a fact? How as humans do we think? Uh, the effect of the technology on our brains, so are we rational? Um, and so increasingly the range of human experience, n n not uh, the, there's principles of maybe abstract, but how, do, how are people affected and how do we behave has also become a set of issues that we're finding anyone interested in technology mobilizing, either on their own principles or with us or, or with others. So I think this translation opportunity to, to build a common language which won't meet the exact traditions of any one of us, um, but I, I, I am hopeful we don't need to go to the lowest common denominator, but, but we can find something general that, that touches the core of humanity for, for so many of us and, and, and build it into some organization and structure that's actually effective. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mitchell. And I now invite Mr. Reed Hoffman. So Mitchell and I have actually worked together for, you know, 
over a decade. Um, so I'll try to, even though some of my comments um, will be directly aligned, I'll try to also broaden the scope some in some ways just because we have a number of things we agree on. Um, one of the things that's been um, amazing to watch about this uh, kind of the, what the growth of the impact of technology is, is that if you look back a couple decades and you looked at the question of ethics and technology, a lot of the questions you would see would be things like, for example, um, uh, you know, access, uh, you know, kind of, is it you, is it, it, can the technology be used by, for example, um, people who have uh, disability or other kinds of things? Like, you'll have a set of those kinds of questions. And part of, of course, the increasing impact and the fact that technology now very quickly moves from uh, being in a garage in Silicon Valley to being used by billions of people around the world, that the questions of impact and what are these ethical questions have grown massively. And so part of what we're like, oh my gosh, there's this stuff. It's a little bit like what Joel was talking about. It's like, well, we just thought we were building some products that we thought people could use to access information. Isn't that just basically a good, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, uh, that, that it is. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, there's, there's, there's a much more uh, complicated infrastructure. And while it's, you know, frequently, there's, there's an obviously a lot of challenges the fact that the technological clock is set by companies. It isn't all challenges, right? So companies say, well, how do we get a lot of customers? How are we of service to them? How do we measure how well they, they use it and they like it? Do they feel that they're, that it's a, that's something good that they participate with? This is not, you know, just kind of unthinking and it is also not only, although obviously there always is a profit motive, but the challenge is as you get large is you go, well, you're primarily focused on the profit motive because the things that tend to lead to that tend to get done, tend to get prioritized. Uh, profit motive leads to the inequality uh, issues that are severe that the uh, Cardinal also uh, in his opening remarks referred to as one of the really key things to pay attention to. And then you also get a set of unintended consequences. Uh, you get things where you were like, oh, actually, in fact, since we are building only within our, you know, kind of a 25-mile radius from where the Mozilla offices are, <laughs> where, 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 all these, where all these things are, um, uh, you know, you, you have a lot of blind spots. And um, probably most importantly, when you deal with the kind of thinking about what's being driven by the commercial world is also the fact that the competition between these companies is actually fairly ferocious, which means that you move, you move really fast in order to get there. The, 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 the player that gets there first at scale tends to win the market. And so part of the, the challenge is how do you both play that intensely competitive game and balance these other issues is part of the, the challenge that's, that's, that's there. And, um, and I, so I think one of the ways to think about uh, the value of conferences uh, like this one, um, 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 Bishop Tai, uh, Mitchell and I, and uh, others here have just come from this event from Optic, uh, which is kind of the, well, how do we help shape and catalyze these builders of technologies? How do we help them understand what the questions are? Like what, like if you, uh, uh, Bishop Tai was absolutely right about the fact that the, uh, Silicon Valley, in as much as it's discussing ethics, which has been in, on the increase but still needs to be a lot more, is discussed in utilitarianism. Of course, we have a fancy new word for it called effective altruism, which is the way that it's <laughs> uh, way that's most often discussed within uh, Silicon Valley. But it is utilitarianism, just to be clear. <laughs> uh, and. Um, and so, and then what are the ways to try to navigate this? So let me touch on a couple of, of kind of the concrete issues that we, we grapple with. So frequently when Silicon Valley people come to events, they say, well, there's, a, there's a, all these issues around data. And you say, yes, that's correct. Like, uh, you know, what data is used to build the products? What kinds of telemetry is okay? Are there privacy rights, which is most often discussed, but also, of course, whose data is being used. So for example, if we're mostly using, uh, call it uh, Caucasian, North American, European data to build health products, 
Well, what does that mean for everyone else, <laughs> right, in terms of how you're doing it? It's not, it isn't just the privacy questions. There's all these questions around data. And often, uh, when I'm speaking to someone who is very well-intentioned, they'll say something like, well, a person owns their own data. That's, that's it, and it's very easy. And you say, well, okay, let's start with something simple, like a picture. Pictures are being taken at this conference. I take a picture of Mitchell. Is that Mitchell's data? Is that my data? Is it the conference's data? <laughs> right. Where is that plan? And that's just a picture, <laughs> right? let alone anything else. And so, so I tend to think that the discourse really needs to be around, well, what are the appropriate uses? What are the appropriate things that both preserve dignity but also help us uh, create the kind of positive benefits and those positive benefits being uh, spread? Another one that's discussed a lot within Silicon Valley because autonomous vehicles is one of the big waves of the last, you know, kind of five to ten years. We already have uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, there are already cars that in selective neighborhoods are driving around without drivers, picking people up and so forth. And you get to this, uh, back to ethics, and, you know, some of these people know that they're so-called the trolley problem, um, but to discuss the trolley problem is you get to... Uh, okay, so uh, what are the balances of good of what risks the vehicle takes for harm to which people? And one of the interesting things, classic kind of commercial motive, is people did a, some surveys to try to figure it out because you survey your customers. And what they found is the customers would like everyone else to be driving in a utilitarian vehicle, and they would like to be driving in a vehicle that preserved their own well-being. <laughs> and that was, that, that, was, that was the consensus view. <laughs> right? And this gets to these questions that are complicated and difficult uh, to sort out. And this is only just, of course, scratching the surface of the kinds of issues that, that are in front of us. And as has been um, you know, mentioned, is that you, know, you get to a question of what is, the, what is the good for humanity, what is a set of values, and it's very easy to say, well, we should be good for humanity. And then you say, okay, well, what's that? Who's saying it? <laughs> right. Uh, what's the level of agreement? You're getting to a kind of a global scope. And what's more, part of the thing I think is also useful in discussions like this is to realize that the end results are going to be messy. You're going to have people who disagree with each other. You're going to have people who say, well, I think this should be the important issue versus that be the important issue, or this is a risk we should take versus that's a risk we should take. Um, and uh, because the clock is set by this you know, kind of commercial competition and a set of development, uh, the clock's not really going to wait, right? So you have to be pragmatic in saying, well, this is the really key thing to do and we'll help here. And um, part of what, um, as one of the technologists that I found very helpful in these optic conversations is to say, okay, well, where are the kinds of traditions to try to figure out what are the most essential questions, not all of them, but the most essential questions that you can preserve and what are the frames to look at it. Uh, so, for example, thinking in terms of human dignity and thinking in ter uh, and those values. And then, um, as Mitchell uh, mentioned, one of the things that we would hope for many, maybe all technology organizations, which Mozilla is, you know, maybe one of the world leaders on, is, well, how are you transparent about your principles? How are you transparent about your values? How do you have discourse about them in ways that um, people can then interface with you and, and you can talk to them about it and you can modify them as you need to. Because again, you're not gonna be all things uh, for all people. And so I will um, uh, end with one um, uh, kind of a funny thing that I actually thought was a good elaboration of the trolley problem, which was um, some work being done at the Media Lab which was, uh, roughly speaking, trying to go from what we sometimes describe as human in the loop, making decision, to society in the loop. And what they did to try to catalyze this and get to a set of ethical values is they took the trolley problem uh, with cars and you know, like what would happen in terms of you know, damage to different kinds of people and constituency and risk, 
and they presented it in a set of visuals to get a large number of people to respond and then take the aggregate of those responses and kind of reflect to them, here's where your response was relative to other people's, here's what, the, here's what if we were all democratically voting, it would look like this between these scenarios. And it's very simple, <laughs> and it's early, and it's not the complete answer, but it's the beginning of trying to say, how do we get to a, to a, um, to a common discussion on this? Um, and let me maybe add one more comment um, kind of on the future work. Uh, many times, I think, uh, a lot of technologists in Silicon Valley um, create an unnecessary terror because they say, well, we're trying to build all these robots. We're trying to build a Star Trek universe. We'd like to have enough prosperity for that. And then they say, don't worry. We're going to have universal basic income. So, um, you know, you go to people whose lives and dignities are in their work and their place in community, and obviously some work is not that much fun and so forth, but you go to them and you say, don't worry, we're going to put you out of work and you're going to be on welfare, but at least you'll have some income, uh, nothing to worry about here. And, of course, uh, you know, that's um, uh, justly uh, kind of concerning and terrifying, but I actually think it, it has two disservices. One is actually, in fact, technology will continue to create a lot more work, like the shift from agriculture to industry, um, so I actually think there will be a bunch of work, but the problem is the transition. The problem is, you know, when you create AV and you have a 50-year-old truck driver, uh, she or he goes, okay, what do I do next now that it's all AV? And yes, you may be creating new neighborhoods. It may be creating new ways of, of new opportunities for work there, but how do I get there? And what are the ways that we do? So with that. This is a good point to, to stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reid. So we had uh, four hour speakers gave us um, many uh, important stimulating thoughts and ideas to think about. Um, several things are already emerging and maybe starting with the point that uh, Cardinal Turkson made about digital technology as being a tool. I think we also heard here that ethics can be considered uh, as a tool for addressing some of the issues we have um, already uh, mentioned here. I think maybe it's also important to distinguish between ethics as a theory and a way of thinking and ethics as a moral behavior. And sometimes as ethicists, we, we are con confused about these things. So um, ethics helps us to think about these big issues, but moral formation and moral behavior um, is, is slightly different, and perhaps digital technology could help with that, but could also hinder. Um, another point, which I think to, uh, may be viewed from a different perspective, the emphasis on, the, on patience as maybe a component of the common good, and on the other hand, that desire to, to be fast and to implement things uh, quickly. So these are just a couple of, of thoughts to, to open up a conversation between uh, four hour speakers. And I have some other questions, but I don't want to, um, to mention them at this point. And I invite you now to perhaps respond and engage with each other. Anything that um, you found controversial or you want immediately to um, give your response. Richard. You know, I, I, I've, I have to confess I'm not sure I understood all of the depth of Monsignor Duffy's comments, but they um, have really stuck with me because I, I think that the question of knowledge and time and how do we as humans and societies perceive the world around us is, is very much an open question. I think if you imagine someone from... You know, say the year 1000, you know, in our society today, our, our views as humans about time and speed and space and reality would be so different from, from theirs that we're clearly still human, uh, but, but our understanding of the world uh, is so different. And so I expect that to happen again. 
Uh, and I, I would expect that I think it will be much less than a 1,000 years because technology is accelerating. The time of change is coming faster and faster. So I, I don't know what the time frame is, but, but I would imagine that if one of us were suddenly moved forward in time, I don't know, 100 years, 150, 200 years, like the nature, the way people understood their reality, at least on this earth, um, uh, and, and possibly beyond, w would really be quite different. Um, we can already see that the nature of knowledge and truth and fact is changing. And so as individuals and as societies, very shortly we will need to grapple with the fact that n nothing digital is necessarily accurate. Pictures, photo, you name it, right? You know, you see a picture of someone you know or a movie, it, it may or may not be true. Right, it, it's increasingly um, the resources needed, the, the ability and the resources needed to create, you know, accurate looking and sounding images of things that never happened it will be with us very soon. So there is a deep question about nature and understanding and truth and knowledge. And, and technology now, as we understand this, can do some things. Like it can trace provenance. I mean, there, there's certainly technical responses so that we're not alone as human beings. But, but th it's a very sort of different way of seeing and sorting and understanding the world. And, and so I, I think this, this um, like a, 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 a approach is, is, is under vast changes. And, and the question of time as well. And, you know, we, we already know that immediate gratification, if you're part of half of the world that's connected and, and you have disposable income, the immediate gratification is, you know, uh, is, is much easier now. So the nature of time and, and desire and, and response is, I think, also up for grabs. Perhaps just to continue this reflection about knowledge... Uh, I think that we, we, we could have a technology uh, as a knowledge and we, we could have a technology as an ethics. But today, what, what we, we, we can build, what we can uh, interpret, what, what we can share could, could be an ethical system. But the question is, what is possible to, to understand? What is possible to share? What is possible to build? What is better for our future? What is better for humanity, for common, common word, for planet, and for, the, for our community? That's to say that the, the ethic is not only a reflection about possible. Yes, it's a reflection about possibilities, capacity, capabilities. But... The question in ethics is the question of uh, future, is the question of uh, what are the conditions for a better life on this planet, uh, for a better life together. And it's clear that uh, ethics today is at the same time ecological ethics and the way to build uh, a system to, to be rich together, to be rich together, because we can receive many things from, from uh, people using new technology, but we can receive many things from people, from poor people and suffering people also and this, and in this world. So the, the question is in, uh, in ethics, as say the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, for example. The question is question of time and question of dialogue with the others. What can we do to develop uh, uh, an approach of time opening to the hope, to uh, hope to be together and to recognize one another as human beings and as a human family, as a human community? And that, the, 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 the reference, uh, the main reference to the human rights. Human rights are not only a respect of life, but to uh, develop uh, the conditions of uh, community. So, Emmanuel Levinas said, time and the other. Time. We need time. We need time. Uh, we need time to, 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 to uh, listen to the other. 
uh, in Amazonia, we say, uh, we begin by silence. <laughs> we, begin, we begin our meeting with silence. Silence, silence to, to listen to, the, to, the, to nature, to, to listen to the wind, to listen to the, to, to, to the others, to listen. And because we are listening, we are creating a, a new world. We are uh, uh, respecting values. And what is finally the, this reference to the, the human dignity if it's not to listen one another? Because dignity is not an, a concept, an abstract, abstract concept. Dignity is the way to meet the other and the way to listen the story of the other. So if our technologies help to uh, realize this meeting and realize this exchange, we are really uh, uh, building a common good because common good finally is our stories exchanged is our uh, way uh, we, 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 we go on together. And this is our common good with a memory, human memory, and the question for me as a, as a teacher is what about our memory, our human memory today, and opening to a reflection about future, what is our conception of future? And somebody, somebody some groups in our world said, no future, but others are perhaps, and I think, I think it's very important for us uh, in our Christian tradition, we are hope. We, 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 we have to offer hope, and we have to offer uh, a reflection about the future, because future is, has a name uh, in our Christian trad tradition, and this uh, name is Jesus Christ. I was very struck when Mitchell mentioned that uh, every product or the product uh, that um, has been pr produced been for the common good, that was the understanding of the scientist. So I think it's clearly be, um, not a matter of willingness the common good, which is one of the conditions of the promotion of the common good, but our um, perhaps mistakes, what is good and what is good for us. And... Here we, we've just uh, been encouraged to think about the future um, and how we envisage that moral good uh, for ourselves as common humanity. But would it be useful, this is a question to all of you here, would it be useful to start with first with obstacles, the current obstacles to the common good, and identify those obstacles in order to understand better the vision of the future goods, or the plurality of the common goods. Would you like to re respond to that? Yep. Um, first, uh, just one thing I wanted to acknowledge that um, Reed mentioned OPTIC, the discussions. That's Eric Salabir of the Dominicans, and OPTIC is an initiative of the Dominican order to bring people from the world of technology into dialogue with people coming from within the Catholic tradition. And that has been a kind of a dialogue and an encounter in the true sense because these are issues that we have to actually begin to bring our expertise. But also, it's, I think that emerges, and this is a first little preliminary comment, is something about a shared concern. And I always think back to, some of you might know, a mentor of mine, the Archbishop of Dublin, Dermot Martin, was involved early on in dialogues between the Vatican and the World Bank about poverty. And one of the things he said, a sober moment for him, was when people from the World Bank economists said to him, you know, you people don't have a monopoly on care for the poor. And we don't have a monopoly on the ethical issues. And that's, I think, one thing we learned together. But coming back to the, 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 the things, the fears I have that maybe lead me towards... Um, I suppose for those of us coming from the Catholic side of the dialogue, we're very familiar with what Pope Francis calls the technocratic paradigm. The technologies don't develop in a vacuum. Technologies develop very often. This is a simplified version. There's a richer area here. But one of the things that all strike me, technologies are always products of a particular economic and political and social environment. 
And one of the things that would worry me that I think we need to watch, and I think people are attentive to this, I'm not doing this in a moralistic way, is that the inequality that is such a feature of our world already can in fact become even worse in the way the technologies may develop, <coughs> inadvertently. If you have the concentration of more and more of the means of production in the hands of a smaller group of people, you're going to get, as we're seeing already, inequality in material terms. But there's also an increasing democratic inequality. Some people have more power to influence the democratic debate. And also, if we move to a global scale, to find jurisdictions that are more amenable to the things they want to do. And slight thing I would worry about is, could we get in all of this a fracturing of a sense of even a shared destiny, an inequality, that we're, we're thinking, we're losing sight of, we're focusing on issues and problems that the economic and political system tell us have potential commercial gain if we resolve them. And do we, will we give the same attention to the potential of the new technologies to help us to deal with much simpler questions, human questions, that will affect broader numbers of people and that will be about um, questions of um, addressing poverty, addressing the impact of the environmental on the poorest. And so that's just one, as I say, how do we ensure that we have true solidarity? I think that's the common good idea. How do we think about the common good? Which is trying to marry a thing as we are not... It's find the balance of what we understand to be a person in society, a person who lives in society with others. Is that just, in some ways, of thinking it's, it's kind of unfortunate that I don't have this world to myself and therefore my decision-making has to take? Or do I see this as actually it's in my nature to be social and I need to think about the consequences, not just for myself, but for others. And I mean, even things like, I was thinking you were, you know, how we think about issues about um, the individual and privacy. I mean, that even in our established tradition was the idea, there is certain information that is mine and I have a right to and nobody else has. If somebody discovers that I have a major illness that leaves me vi likely to black out at a certain stage, it's probably that person's decision and responsibility to ensure I'm not driving. So how have we negotiated things like that? that it's not just about we live as... Now, there are other aspects of it's not the society controls or I'm just a, in function of society, I have my individuality, but there's balancing in how we find that. One other thing that I just want to kind of... Um, I suppose it's a thing, Anna, you mentioned there about we can have ethical systems and ways of analysing, but do we have the moral formation? Was a concept that in the old way I used to teach moral theology was this notion of antecedent willingness. Unless I'm willing to do that which is right or avoid doing that which is wrong, often at a cost to myself, I probably won't genuinely try and search for the right or wrong answer because I'd be looking for the convenient answer. So where is that conversion or that drive? And one of the things that gives me hope is the number of people working in areas like the Valley who have made choice, I am not willing to work on certain type of projects because I have an ethical difficulty with them, or I prefer to work for a company which won't pay me as much, but where I see a good ethical purpose. So I'd, I'd be interested in some of that, the, reg, the, the ethical barometer of the world you're in as well. Um, in terms of, I mean, there's obviously a great range of concerns. I mean, inequality, uh, both within uh, the wealthy societies and also globally, is super important. I'd say the two things that I kind of most focus on structurally, one of them I already mentioned, which is the fact that there is this kind of competition between companies, countries, et cetera, and that sets a time clock on everything. Um, and it's, I, I, that's one I don't know how to really move that much because, um, you know, one of the things I think is a bit of a fundamental uh, part of human nature is this competition between groups and can we agree 
you know, what the parameters are, I'm, I'm concerned about that. But one of the more deep ones is that um, part of what happens when you look at technology development is, is a framework that we frequently use is platforms and applications. And uh, one of the things that happens with platforms is they really get locked and established. A uh, platform is like the OS on your mobile phone, Android or iOS, you know, obviously Windows. Um, part of the thing about thinking about artificial intelligence is that's also, in fact, you know, has kind of platform technology, even though it's probably going to be mostly in servers in the cloud. And once that gets really locked, it's actually very hard to move. It isn't just really a question of, like, oh, well, you're just going to change that, right? And it's like, well, actually, in fact, there's a whole bunch of things that have standardized that and everything else, and it becomes uh, difficult to move. And so for me, part of the value in conversations like today, uh, conversations around Optic, is trying to figure out what are the key things in the platform. So as much as it doesn't, as it gets locked down and built into a standard, <laughs> right, we've tried not to go seriously wrong, and we have parameters of flexibility. And... Um, part of how I try to, within the scope of Silicon Valley, um, try to help with this in, in this small way, but just an a, a example that may be helpful here, is that um, we have a kind of a, a affection for a question, which is what do you believe that most other people don't believe is a framework for, for frequently how we will interview people, talk to each other, et cetera. And when I was asked that question a couple of years ago on stage for a, a startup incubator called Y Combinator, as I said, that every technology company should have an explicit theory of human nature that they're operating on so that they should say it. This is what we think human nature is. This is what we're, how we're navigating and doing. Part of it is so that you can be directing product design. Part of it is so that you can be transparent for discussion within the company uh, possibly outside the company as a way of trying to navigate that because the challenge when you get to technology is that you get very precise. Part of the reason I was using, like, for example, the autonomous vehicle question is that, you know, uh, we as human beings can rely upon our collective senses of judgment and integrity and everything else and talk about that. When you start making the technology, the technology starts getting very precise. And then all of a sudden these questions where we might have uh, the me we might not fully confront the messiness of different values and of different moral systems. All of a sudden, you have to because of the the the, the nature of technology. It was interesting. Maybe I want to maybe Paul and I are switching places here. Um, I, you know, as a barrier, I would say human nature. Because we do often, it, 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 yes, I want everyone else to have a car that's utilitarian, but the one I'm in or the one my family is in, you know, I want that one safe, right? And, and so we do see individual sacrifices, but as, as in our societies and cultures, we, we as a species seem to have an us and them gene, I don't mean literally there's one gene like that, but it it does seem to be a, a part of so many societies. And so, um, and, and currently we have the technical or the, the products that seem to emphasize that. Uh, and we certainly now have means to manipulate people in that direction when you want to. So partly there's technical response. So we, we don't... I, I, I should say that I, I, I'm not sure about relying on technology or, or commercial companies or products to serve all of humanity. Right? Because I keep looking for, well, where was that? Did we design cars that way? Did we design ovens that way? Like, where is it that we have the model that says that, you know, a, a few commercial companies are somehow going to be successful even if they want to? Um, because who even knows what serves humanity in, you know, in these in these issues? So, so, uh, uh, but the, there are things I think once we understand problems that technology can do to be better. And and I think what aspect of human nature gets triggered is definitely got improvement on the technical side. Uh, we don't know enough yet. Uh, we don't have the social science research, I think, to understand really what is a product that is engaging and that isn't. Uh, 
in, in the current model. Um, but but those are areas where we, we could certainly make progress. And, and I, I think in the phase of, like, what data is available to social scientists to understand is what do the global institutions fund? Um, the Y Combinator that Reed mentioned is a, you know, a, a, this won't be technically accurate. It's like a factory for turning out Silicon Valley startups. Um, and um, and for funding them, uh, uh, so um, so it's easy to get funding in that area. But but as institutions and governments or norm setting orgs, the funding for organizations that are trying to build technology or even understand how technology influences people is really low, um, because a lot of a lot of these organizations are social enterprises. You know, they're desperate. They'll come to us. You know, Mozilla's not that big. Um, Reed probably gets a lot of them too. Like, how do you survive? How do you hire the right talent? So uh, in, the, in the organizational space, this question of researching how does technology, what are different ways in which could help humans be better? Um, and, and sometimes the art projects are, experiment with this because they're really interested in humanity. So um, it seems odd, I feel like, from the technical or the Silicon Valley side of the house to talk, to talk about um, human nature um, but but we have um, uh, maybe it's not the lowest common denominator, but but we're in the wrong end of the spectrum of of the behavior that technology triggers right now. Actually, given that we're here um, of all places, I will say one of the things that I say in Silicon Valley in a number of different lectures that I get people to wake up and pay attention to this question. I think Mitchell's heard this from me before. But um, in order to get people to pay attention, they say, what do you invest in? And I say, I invest in one or more of the seven deadly sins. Can you say more of that? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's partially when you get to a theory of human nature. Of course, part of the reason why these are the seven deadly sins is they're the natural human reflexes across large-scale people, whether it's you know, sloth, vanity, wrath, Etc. This is tends to be what happens. Now, obviously, when you say investing in it, you're not trying to necessarily amplify them, but you are. If you trigger, it, if you if you hook into that level of emotional infrastructure, um, then actually, in fact, you can get to a very broad product because the target within Silicon Valley is how do you get to billions of people, and so inevitably, when I say this, giving a talk to people trying to have them think a little bit more broadly about human nature, investment, creation of products, and so forth, they will say, well, what was LinkedIn? And of course, the answer is greed. Now, it's not really what we're trying to do, but it's an instance of what you're connecting into that causes hundreds of millions and billions of people to say, I want to connect and participate in this. Right now, obviously, what we're trying to do is help them become better, help them interact better, help them uh, develop their working lives in ways that they're interfacing with um, each other in a lifetime of work relationship and collaboration that is actually the target but part of their motive is a higher salary next year I think this reminds me of um, the end of ethics of Baruch Spinoza who after having done uh, a lot of his studies and explanation what what good life is about and all sorts of ideas related to ethics in the end he he says, um, this is paraphrasing, that um, excellence or moral excellence, excellence is rare and mor growth, moral growth is, is very difficult. And similar things Kant and other philosophers um, mentioned as well. That somehow growing in a moral way is it's difficult, it's probably boring, and um, as most of the moral psychological theories suggest, we don't move beyond certain stage. So I think there is something here about human nature and our resistance to be better, that it's a challenge for, for, for all of us uh, here to think about, including those of us who are dealing with ethical theories. Um, I'm often using um, a very simple model that I've learned actually from Jim Keenan, who, who is here, Professor James Keenan. Um, and he, in one of his um, um, works, he reminds that in order to develop and maybe foster the common good, 
as well. We need to think about our relationality, a word, an idea that has been mentioned in this um, session several times um, in, in three ways, that we are always relational to the other who is close to us, um, intimate relationships, family relationships. We're also relational to the other who is distant. And we talked about here also about humanity, global context, but we are also in relationship to ourselves, um, a very different type of relationality. And in order to function well as a human being, we need to attend to these three types. And I think this could be a useful reminder when we are dealing with various issues of a global, uh, more local nature, because common goods attempts to bring both of these um, the individual and the common humanity together. I think it's very important to clarify what, what we call common good, uh, because it's not so easy to, uh, um, to understand common and good. What is common and what is good? Traditionally, we, 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 we think about common good as goods we share, goods we share in our community. And these goods uh, come from uh, past generations and we receive, we receive goods not only uh, good as a product, but uh, clearly a good as a, as a um, understanding, understanding and values and values. And uh, uh, this uh, reflection about common good uh, touches the, 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 the question of to be together today and to be together tomorrow. So we, we have to clarify this first level of uh, common goods and common good. Could, and, could yeah. you name some of those goods? It will help us. Yeah. What would be the goods we're talking about here in the context of digital age? Yeah, that, 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 that's my second point. The second point could be to, to uh, um, open a reflection about information and transmission and communication and news as good. That, that's that's a, a, a very important uh, point in our debate. Now we could say that each new, each new, um, it's each message we receive could be uh, interpreted as a good, but we, we have to we have to uh, to be uh, uh, to to develop uh, a critic approach about that because we we know that <laughs> it's a, the the question of the, the, the fake news, <laughs> you know. But it, it's very important to. Uh, to debate, to, to have a time, to have, all, it's always the question of time, a time to debate about the signification, meaning of news and of uh, news we receive. That the, the, the question of communication. Communication is not, is not uh, uh, um, only uh, a way, but it's a way of, for truth. And what is our, our, our uh, intelligence, what is our uh, knowledge about, uh, what is our, debate, our critical debate about truth? And that, for me, it's very important because common good is good we share, information, God for community, and, God for, and good for, uh, for future generation. That's the first, the first point I think it's important to underline. The second point is to clarified what we call responsibility in this context. Um, to, 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 to assume a responsibility means to re respond directly to the other person. That to say, to respond to uh, other person, but in the, at the same time, to respond about our roles and about our... Uh, um, duties, and, uh, and I, I think uh, it's very important to, to 
to uh, go on on this uh, uh, concept and value uh, of uh, responsibility. And the third point I would like to, uh, uh, to um, emphasize is the concept of technological paradigm. I'm very interested by this call of the Holy Father in Laudato Si when he says, we, perhaps we need a new cultural paradigm about development. He said, cultural paradigm. And my question is, how can we develop and build a new paradigm? Paradigm is not a model. Paradigm is before the model. Paradigm is what we, 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 we can uh, uh, share to build a model, economical model, technological model. And what is in our model today, and what could be a new model, a new model for, for, for uh, instance, the, 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 a new model for development, human development, and integral development, as we say in our dicastery and uh, in our mission. So, what could be this new paradigm? I, I'm sure that we are on a dialectic moment between new and this movement of always and all is new and the, 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 the question of memory and the question of human memory. We, we, perhaps we, we have to, to revisit the concept of memory and values. Values are the, 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 the richness of uh, our common richness, uh, dignity, responsibility, uh, fraternity, human, human uh, nature, and so on. And uh, the question of memory and the question of future of life. I think it's very important to try to speak about this new paradigm, which is the, 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 the support, which is the, 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 the basis of a new model, a new cultural model in our uh, context today. I think this, this idea of, of goods is probably really useful for the rest of our conference here, and I think you've helped us to um, recognize some of those goods, like um, truth definitely was mentioned many times, and we know the truth has, is an ambiguous term and it has many meanings. We talked about knowledge, intelligence, understanding, um, uh, truth as fact, uh, facts, um, and... Ideas related to, to truth are, are quite complex, but truthfulness and this hostility to secrecy or perhaps manipulation, um, more transparency, these are all uh, ideas related to that good. We also talked about solidarity, uh, another very uh, big component of the common good, but very difficult to, to properly grasp what we exactly mean. And in some way, maybe technology, or especially social media, creates a new way of bonding. So in some way, we have perhaps more solidarity than or, or um, this place of solidarity than, than, than before. But that's not the kind of solidarity you, you were referring to. We, we are talking about solidarity human qua human, that each person matters, each um, each individual is important. How do we see the other person? And I think this idea of the other as being in relationship is emerging more, more strongly. Um, we talked about privacy. Um, could that be considered a, a, as the good, part of the common good? Um, responsibility uh, several times was, was mentioned. And again, patience, whether um, this could be uh, a component of the common goods, and in, if so, in, in what way? Um, dignity. And it was really interesting that um, our speakers who are very much involved in these practical leadership roles in 
in, in companies, entrepreneurs, are using this language in, in a very meaningful way, like truth and dignity, both of you alluded. And we are on, on this side, we are trying to engage with those issues. Um, the new paradigm, uh, is that something that needs to be built on dialogue? And if so, we are going to disagree a lot, uh, including about our view of the human nature. Uh, that's definitely um, on the agenda. And if we are going to disagree, as, as we will, how are we going to handle disagreements? Do we have any ethical model that will help us to handle disagreements? And we know we are very poor, including in our own church, with handling disagreements and handling difficult issues. Um, we all, I think, in this session very much appreciate the idea of interdisciplinarity. So the question is always emerging apart from us representing our disciplines here, who else need to be our partner in the dialogue? Um, ethicists and scientists, but that's probably not enough. Um, we all touched upon poverty um, and, and talked about economic, but also spiritual poverty as an obstacle to the common good. Distribution of power, competition and structural issues. So these are the few ideas that are already emerging on our map of the common good that we um, could bring later um, in our more focused conversations. And perhaps rather than building a platform, which was uh, we had a critique of the idea of platform or what good platform perhaps should be, what we are trying perhaps to arrange here is some kind of framework for thinking, this is just the beginning of, of our conversation. Um, anything else? We've got about 10 minutes to add anything else that we want to, the, to add to this map, to the framework that hopefully will help us to um, address some of the very difficult issues that are facing us, even in this conference. The question of how global we are is something I, I think should be added to the discussion. And who's included and how? Maybe, the, maybe one way of saying that is a new social paradigm where inclusion is uh, broader and deeper. Uh, certainly the issues we're facing are global, and not just climate change, but but given the population of the earth, um, the large migrations of people, uh, we haven't seen all of them, certainly. And, and, and as those two interact, um, uh, the movement of people may be really massive. And so the, the question of what is global, what is humanity, what are the, how do we think, how do we incorporate a broad set of people in not just discussion, but decision-making and resource allocation. Uh, so I think this question of actual inclusion uh, is going to be really huge. Uh, and, and then you add to that the half of humanity that's women um, uh, and, the, and the need for inclusion and decision-making, uh, both, for, for, both for perspective, uh, new ideas, uh, legitimacy. So the, the question of who determines the common good and how and who's mm -hmm. it really benefiting and what are the pretty, uh, I would say, deep new paradigm needed mm -hmm. to actually build something that's credible and legitimate and effective uh, for humanity is a big topic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. The, this point on inclusion is really probably one of the first components. So thank you very much. Any other items we would well, like? Well, I just wanted to emphasize the immediacy and the pragmatism and the non-abstraction of some of these things. So we are all already cyborgs. Mm -hmm. Everybody has one of these in their pocket. The question of what your identity is, which groups you're part of, how you're communicating with people, right? how you perceive this out yourself in the mirror of this, right? what the Rorschach test of this is. You begin to get to questions like what is memory? Memory is redefined, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't use this for that, 
And then you get into the kind of more subtle questions around, for example, knowledge or um, you know, trust. Well, think of the ways that your mind is being shaped by the fact that when you use a search engine, how which results that search engine is giving you is affecting what your paradigm is, what your way of thinking is, right? Cyborgs are not a science fiction thing of the future. We're here already. Just a, a couple of points, just randomly to address. One is, I think, the issue about disagreement around ethical issues. I think disagreement is really a great testimony to caring and for searching for truth. It's when we given up on even trying to disagree, and each, you know, we agree to disagree as an ex which kind of means you head off to your corner and say the other person is just useless and I am right, and, but I couldn't be bothered even trying to engage them. So I think disagreement, and I think disagreement is going to be inevitable because the complexity and the issues, and also even in terms of within our own discipline, what do we mean by human nature? What is the relationship? What is intelligence? What are the different types of intelligence? And many of my free will is determined as we, if we were to open up to genetics and neuroscience and you become much more, but what is that essential freedom we still hold? And I think this agreement testifies to some extent to a debate and a discussion. So we have to live with some of that at times, I think. I think the agreements we may be able to get will be on what are the things that are definitely wrong. I mean, you know, slavery, trafficking of people, how we become more sensitive to those, and can we build consensus around that? That's just one issue. The other one that, and this is a critique of myself as a, somebody who taught and teaches moral theology, and I would always have been throwing out the term the dignity of the human person, the dignity of the human person. And my little learning experience on that was sitting on a railway platform in India and the train was four hours late and we had to sit there and you begin to observe everything that's happening around you and seeing people who were living under the railway platform and when a train came in or out and people threw away all the rubbish, moved in immediately to gather that rubbish and were at the bottom of a recycling chain. And by any standard, those people had very little dignity. What I tried to think, for me, it, maybe it was late in the day for this to happen to me, was that dignity is actually the claim on me rather than the automatic thing the other person has. They have an intrinsic dignity, but that dignity will be meaningless unless I experience it about claim. And I think part of that is then the paradigm we use in the common good. How do we get an inclusive understanding of this world? How do we think about those who are different, those who are other? Again, and I think one in testimony to a digital example that I think transformed discipline in a very positive, this sense of solidarity was about three, four years ago, there was a, almost a moral panic in Europe about the numbers of people that were coming in and coming across seas and coming across borders. And many politicians were upping the rhetoric and kind of talking about swarms and hordes and invasions and the language. A young child dies on a beach in Greece, and that photograph of showing a young child somehow broke the discourse because it, it created an imaginative sense of solidarity. And that sense of how we build that solidarity in that sense. Um, one, again, a friend of mine, if you ever ask him how he is, He's the father of a relatively large family. He always says to me, I'm never any better than the least healthiest of my children. <laughs> kind of, you know, I can never feel better than the one that's worrying me. Can we have that sense of solidarity when we think about ourselves, that broadening out a sense of, and I think this is about all sorts of ways in which the arts can use the digital media particularly to help to create a sense of solidarity and human feeling, not seeing the other as different, as threat, as enemy to be feared, but somehow as recognizing a common humanity. And I think there's work to be needed to do that. And the final thing is just a little confession time is, what I've, as you talked about, we're all cyborgs. Occasionally I do a thing which is like a modern form of the examination of conscience, which is open, open up my browser history and see where have I been for the last couple of days and weeks and where have I been spending time 
And it's not a very nice thing. And it would give me a certain desire for... Um, and I think I see it in when you said about the, the you know, the, the deadly sins. Having read the stuff about Tristram Harris and others who have recognized that the way we get your attention is not by sending you high-minded poetry and beautiful new art, but it's about bread and circuses and going down to the bottom level there and how we have to become more... And that's, that is my fault, but then that's also been programmed by others. So I go and I search for things and they know the little things that I'm likely to to dabble at and to attract me, how we need to become more conscious of our own agency in that kind of context. I think there are just some comments. Yeah. Just two references. The first reference I'm thinking of is the, um, the way of uh, the philosopher, French philosopher Paul Ricoeur about the ethical way, the, 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 the way to think ethics. And Paul Ricoeur said that uh, the, the, the ethical research, the ethical reflection, is to consider the condition to develop a good life, a good life, the, the promise of each life and the promise of our common life, human life. That, it's interesting to, 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 to think this first level what contributes, what, that, what, what, what does contribute to, to, to a, a good life, a good human life? What contributes to, the, to, the, to develop the capacity to develop uh, humanity first? The second level of the, this approach in Paul Ricoeur is, you say, for and with the other. Not only for the other not only in a, in a paternalistic uh, uh, attitude, but with the other. That's to say that we can develop uh, our humanity in dialogue, in exchange of our experiences, not in a, a position uh, inequality, of inequality in this uh, uh, knowledge and technologies. And the third level of the ethical perspective in, uh, in this uh, reflection of Paul Ricoeur is to add good life with and for and with the other in good institutions, in good organization. That's very interesting because it's not only uh, uh, an experience of, in, of dialogue uh, mutual dialogue, but to try to um, put this, uh, this view in a society, in institution. That's my first reference. And I, I, I was thinking about that uh, in, our, in our discussion, in our, in our de debate, in our discussion. The second reference is uh, the way uh, to uh, think about solidarity in the encyclica Solicitudo Rei Socialis in 1987, when John Paul II said, in the global situation, in, in the situation of interdependence between countries, between people in our world today, the answer, the, the, the proposition we have to offer is the solidarity, the principle of solidarity. And he, he proposed a definition for solidarity. Solidarity is to consider the other as, uh, to, to translate, as a support, and in, as an equal, uh, inequality, as a brother or a sister. It's very interesting. The three, the three, the three uh, uh, words are interesting. Support or help, Equal, equality, uh, uh, a way to, 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 to look at the other in a, uh, as a, an equal, equality, inequality, and uh, as a brother or a sister. And I, 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 I would just finish saying that perhaps dignity, this reference to dignity, is not so easy to, 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 to propose this uh, reference this value of dignity. 
dignity perhaps is the way to look at the other. We receive dignity and we give dignity. We, we, we have to receive dignity to, to receive the encouragement to, 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 to develop our, our capacities. And, and we, we, we are called perhaps to uh, offer dignity that to, see, to look at the other as a promise and not only as the poverty or, uh, in our condition. So these, these uh, two references for me are uh, very, very important in, in our debate today. Thank you. Can I add to that notion of solidarity? Um, the, the root word is solid, something about firmness. And, uh, and uh, apparently, according to the Roman law, um, solidum was um, an obligation to repay debt for anyone in the group who was not able to do that. So that kind of common responsibility. I think these two final ideas, uh, solidarity and dignity, um, are really important for us for the end of this session. Um, we have raised many questions and embarked on um, hopefully di dialogical encounters with each other. Um, we haven't r resolved anything, but hopefully <laughs> we've got a map of ideas we can think more about. And um, with our um, imagination have been challenged and probably will be challenged even more throughout this conference. So this, um, exactly finishing on time, this gives me once again a pleasure to thank you, all our speakers, for your amazing contributions to this dialogue. And thank you again. <laughs>